I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Well, I, I think that's the magic, right? And I think in any field, the best people are going to redefine the space that they're in in ways that are very personal. And I've seen it in more than one field. You know, think about Paul McCartney. I mean, he he was going to be great no matter what. And he happened to find that early and develop a craft to go with the art. And Mark Zuckerberg was the same way as a programmer. When I met him, he was 22 years old. And he'd been doing Facebook at that point for a couple of years. When I met him, interestingly enough, it was a total accident. Um, a friend calls up. He worked at Facebook said, my boss got a huge problem. And uh, would you take a meeting with him? So, so I'm, I'm just saying the context. I think it's impossible to really do you justice in a quick introduction, but you've been an advisor to everybody from Steve Jobs and Bill Gates on. In the I, had, I, guys. I Well, the thing is, I'd either been partners with them or I'd managed money for them. I've been friends with them or done deals with them or whatever. So I knew everybody in Silicon Valley. So when I met Mark, he was different from everybody, but in a kind of really cool, interesting way. I mean, a little creepy too, but you got to keep in mind, as you say, tech entrepreneurs aren't like you and me. So he was really different. And it just happens that I took a couple minutes at the beginning to introduce myself and just explain to him, I wanted him to hear this before he talked to me, that if it hadn't already happened, somebody was going to try to buy the company. It was probably going to be Microsoft or Yahoo. They were going to offer a billion dollars, and everybody knew was going to tell him to take it. And I said, I hope you don't do that because they'll kill it. And candidly, the people who signed up for your vision signed up for your vision. So if you're not ready to sell, I hope you'll hang in there. This is 2006. 2006. Facebook's only two years old. He's 22. So we have this really weird conversation where I'm sitting in this conference room, the two of us about three feet apart. He goes through literally five minutes of thinker poses. He doesn't say a word. You, you mentioned that in the book, that he was just kind of just silent, and, and like you said, the thinker poses. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself at the beginning, this is really interesting. He's trying to decide if he trusts me. You know, if I evaluate him as an entrepreneur, I'm going, this is really great. At the three-minute mark, I might, literally, my fingernails are just pounding into the size of this chair. Considering how much tension is involved in someone being silent mid-conversation, do you feel an urge to interrupt or say, hey, can I get you a cup of water? Or no, no. He, he was so active while he was thinking that I was afraid if I interrupted him, I would like, you know, put a tear in the space-time continuum. You know, he was a extraordinarily energetic but silent character in this thing. And 
you're watching physical comedy in front of your eyes. And I was a little bit intimidated by it. It had never happened to me in my entire professional life that anybody had ever gone even a minute of dead silence while I thought about something. So anyway, it takes five minutes and I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. I'm just trying not to scream. And then all of a sudden, finally, he really visibly relaxes. He's decided. I am so excited. Roger McNamee. You know, Roger, I've been reading about you for decades. I'm about to introduce you. You run Elevation Partners along with your, everybody in the world would love to say this, along with your partner, Bono, from you two. You were an early investor in Google, Facebook, so many technology companies. You've been a technology investor since the 80s. You've been running um, various VC funds since the 1991. You, you know everybody in Silicon Valley. You just wrote a book, Zucked, uh, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, which we're about to talk about. But I'm really honored, honestly, to have you in the studio here. I, I got to tell you, it, it is really a privilege for me. It, you know, the, the chance to be in a comedy club and do a podcast is like, you know, a highlight not just of this trip, but just in general, because I'm a big fan. Well, if you ever want to, if you're ever in New York, want to come to the com a comedy show, there's uh, well. Now that I now that I know I can do it, I will take you up on this. Seinfeld was here a couple of weeks ago. John Oliver was here last week. We we have everybody come up here. Yeah, well, that those are both hot buttons for me. So, and you're a performer. This is the one thing that's always mentioned about you in every single article, literally for the past twenty years. You're you're the investor who's a rock star. Like you have your own band. Well, hang on, Alice. I got to cut you off there. So I learned from being partners with Bono that there's two kinds of musicians. There's performing musicians and there's rock stars. And you know how to tell the difference? So for a performing musician like myself, when you have a free hour, you spend it practicing. But if you're a rock star and you got a free hour, you know what you do? PR. Really? And yeah, that's the difference. So I'm a musician. Bono's a rock star. But I don't understand. What is he doing? And we're, we're going to get to Zuck, but you just opened the can of worms. What, what, he, maybe he's doing PR because he got to that point of rock starhood after practicing. No, so no, much. no. Sorry, he practiced like crazy. I'm just yeah. saying once you hit rock star status, there isn't any time left to practice. I mean, I'm not, I'm joking to a degree, right? But, but basically that's the way to think about the distinction is there's, I don't have either the need or the opportunity to do PR. So I practice. So, so do you think a couple of things now, now that, now that we're on this, but we're Zucked by the way, which I read is a great book and it talks all about among other things, um, the the November 2016 election in Facebook and what really happened. Rogers, who who was a, one of the first investors in Facebook, did did the deep dive and did so much amazing research and has been involved in in how to correct things. And then there was the whole scandals with Cambridge Analytica, where we realized all of our data is basically everywhere, and it's not just Facebook, it's Google, it's all these social media platforms. We're going to get to that. But two questions. One is. Do you think the 10,000 hour rule applies? You think Bono did 10,000 hours and you yet have not? No, so <laughs> for music, so I am absolutely convinced that that people who are drawn to something early in life and devote massive amounts of time to it in their youth, so in their preteens and teens, that 10,000 hour rule absolutely applies. If you don't get the full 10,000 hours in by the time you're say 15, you're probably not going to, or if, you, if you're not well on the way, you're probably not going to be able to make a career doing something that is either artistic, creative, or craft-based. And interestingly enough, that applies to computer programming, right? The people who become real rock stars are all doing it in size when they're 14. And, By the way, me? Yeah. Not that I'm a rock star computer programming, but I was doing it in yeah. size of 14. Yeah, exactly. But and, I just didn't enjoy it. So literally by the time... Even though I still occasionally do it, by the time I was 32, I stopped most of my programming. I didn't, so, I didn't like it. So my first piano teacher was, um, shall we say, somebody who who was um, not a person a young boy would want to be spending a lot of time around, and that scared me off, and it delayed my 10,000 hours mm -hmm. until my late teens, mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And so I have learned to become a professional musician. But I missed the window where I could have made a career of it because when I was in college and in a band that might have made it, I just didn't have the self-confidence as a musician to 
try to make a career out of it. And, and so and I went and got a day job. So people like Bono or the Beatles or whoever we know and can think of and has lasted through the decades, these people started off young. And I feel like they've developed their own unique sound in the sense that, and maybe this is just really basic on the music side. I'm sorry we're spending even two minutes talking about this because I do want to get to this other stuff, but nobody sounds like you two. Nobody sounds like Pink Floyd. Nobody sounds like the Rolling Stones. How is it that these bands develop such unique sounds and no one ever sounds like them ever again? Well, I, I think that's the magic, right? And I think in any field, the best people are going to redefine the space that they're in in ways that are very personal. And I've seen it in more than one field, right? Obviously, you can see it in literature. Comedy. You can see it in comedy. It's all over the place. And so, but that's not, you know, when you go to the comedy business or the music business, it's full of people who aren't quite at that level. You know, the way I think about it is there's a metaphor in golf that the gap between the best golfer and the 100th best golfer is probably about the same as the 200th best golfer and the 10,000th best golfer, right? That at the very top, there's much more of a gap than you would think. And I've certainly seen that in music, that the best people I play with, I just, it wouldn't have mattered how hard I played forever. These people just have, you know, think about Paul McCartney. I mean, he, he was going to be great no matter what, and he happened to find that early and develop a craft to go with the art. And Mark Zuckerberg was the same way as a programmer. When I met him, he was 22 years old, and he'd been doing Facebook at that point for a couple of years. And before that, it was kind of a bled out of uh, his his face mash in Harvard, where yeah, it was kind of like was, a hot or not. He, of, he of was Harvard. already a hacker, right? And really, the the kind of creative destruction, but also the defiance of authority, were there from an early age. When I met him, interestingly enough, it was a total accident. Um, a friend calls up. Right? I didn't, and he wasn't even a friend at that point. It was somebody I barely knew. But he worked at Facebook and said, my boss got a huge problem. And uh, would you take a meeting with him? And at that this point- This is 2006. 2006. Facebook's only two years old. He's 22. They have practically no revenue. They don't really have a, they don't have a business model, but they had two things that were magical. I mean, and to think that people that young could have come up with this. They had this idea that, for how to connect the whole world. And it started with this notion of authenticated identity because that simplified the design of the network because each person would be only one node. And that simplified the addressing, which made scaling much easier. And uh, can, I, can I add to that just real quickly? Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry if I interrupt a little just to fill in some blanks. So, and you mentioned this in the book, there were obviously social networks before Facebook. There was there were Friendster, lots. Six Degrees, GeoCities, MySpace, and on and on and on. And the only other person who's ever been on this podcast who said exactly what you said uh, was Peter Thiel, who, because I asked him when he had just come out with the book Zero to One, he basically said, you want to enter a space where there's no competition, where you have a monopoly. And I said, oh, there was a million social networks. There was even MySpace when Facebook came out. And he said, no. The one thing Facebook had a monopoly on was identity, authentic and, identity. And this is really profound because essentially we'd already learned starting with, you know, coming back to my music roots, The Well, which was one of the proto-social networks in the days before the web. And 1992, 93, I was on there every day. And, you know, and the, we learned it in chat rooms and the and the message boards and things like that, that if you allow identity, trolls take over really quickly. And in fact, you typically saw it between fifty and 100,000 members, and all of a sudden the thing is completely swamp. So Zuck's insight about identity was, in my mind, virtuoso stuff. I mean, every bit as unique as Edge's guitar sound, which really defines you too. And he also had this notion, which was also powerful, that you should be able to control what happens to the content you put on there. And both of those things were fundamental at the beginning. They were part of what distinguished my relationship with in the early days because I looked at it and I said, boy, he could go all the way to 100 million people in English-speaking countries, right, and have a business that would be as important at that scale as Google was at that time, which is to say, you know, one of the two coolest companies in Silicon Valley. In your mind then, how did you, know, how did you think they would get beyond the fifty to 100,000 point of view without introducing 
what what you in the book call bad actors like well, people not so again i thought that that authenticated identity and control of your personal content would would do that that they once you keep out basically what happens is anonymity invites people to behave badly and if you are identified with everything you do then social stigma comes into the equation and people are going to be more reluctant to behave badly it won't eliminate bad actors completely, but it makes it much, much more difficult. And in the early days, and again, keep in mind, my first meeting with Zuck was before, before newsfeed. It was when it was just high school and college students. And the you know you needed to have an address for the school you went to, right? And then you had after that you had to have a a an authenticated corporate email. I mean, he was really serious about it. And I was convinced. I mean, I had looked really closely at the prior social networks, and I would understood that anonymity was a core part of their problem. And so he was really different. And it just happens that I took a couple minutes at the beginning to introduce myself and just explain to him, I wanted him to hear this before he talked to me, that if it hadn't already happened, somebody was going to try to buy the company. It would probably going to be Microsoft or Yahoo. They were going to offer a billion dollars, and everybody knew was going to tell them to take it. And I said, I hope you don't do that because they'll kill it. And candidly, the people who signed up for your vision signed up for your vision. So if you're not ready to sell, I hope you'll hang in there. Well, it turns out he was coming to see me because Yahoo had offered a billion dollars to buy the company. And everybody had done precisely what I told them I thought they would probably wind up doing. So we have this really weird conversation where I'm sitting in this conference room at Elevation, the two of us about three feet apart, both of us on comfy chairs because this, you know, we were big in video games. And so this room was a video game room and it was just full of comfy chairs. It was like in here, and except much smaller. And we, we roll large here at the podcast studio. Yeah, I can see that. And so anyway, he, he, he goes through literally five minutes of thinker poses. He doesn't say a word. You you mentioned that in the book that he was just kind of just silent and, and like you said, the thinker poses. And I'm saying he was trying to decide. I've never met this guy. He's just predicted the future. I haven't told him that that's what he's done. Do I trust him? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself at the beginning, this is really interesting. He's trying to decide if he trusts me. So I'm thinking, that's good. I like that in an entrepreneur. He's careful. He obviously listened really carefully to what I said. That makes me feel good. These are all, you know, if I evaluate him as an entrepreneur, I'm going, this is really great. At the three-minute mark, my literally, my fingernails are just pounding into the size of this chair. Did you, considering how much tension is involved in someone being silent mid-conversation, do you feel an urge to interrupt or say, hey, can I get you a cup of water? Or- no, no. He he was so active while he was thinking that I was afraid if I interrupted him, I would like, you know, put a tear in the space-time continuum. He, you know, he was a extraordinarily energetic but silent character in this thing. And you're watching physical comedy in front of your eyes. And... I was a little bit intimidated by it. It had never happened to me in my entire professional life that anybody ever gone even a minute of dead silence while I thought about something. Not like so so I think I it's impossible to really do you justice in a quick introduction, but you've been an advisor to everybody from Steve Jobs and Bill Gates on and some and John so Doerr and I the had, I, guys. I, well the thing is I'd either been partners with them or I had managed money for them, I've been friends with them or done deals with them or whatever. So I knew everybody in Silicon Valley who was around from say eighty two to that time, so which I was feel Bill Gates must have been a little bit like that with the silence sometimes. Well, I never had that experience with Bill though. That's the interesting thing. With Bill, you knew where you stood. I mean, typically he would say something like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And with Bill, that was not to dismiss the conversation, but that was rather an invitation to get into an argument. And the first time he said it, I was like, whoa. And then I realized, no, I'm not going to take that crap from this guy. He's the same age as me. I'm not going to do that. So I fought back, and it turned out that was the right response. I got lucky the first time, and then I learned. But you know, with Steve, it was totally different. With Steve, it was like, you listened really carefully because there, you know, each word was imbued with all kinds of extra meaning, and uh, you know, I wound up doing several very interesting things with him over the years. I mean, again, we weren't close friends. I wasn't 
you know, I'm not a person who spent, who combined work and play much. So, but I knew them professionally really, really well, and not just them, but Gordon Moore and uh, like you, you could know, call Steve Jobs up though, and he'd pick up the phone. Yeah, when when we were doing something together, yes. Uh, keep in mind, he, I didn't just call him up for fun. I never called anybody up for fun. So if he had something in mind, he would call me. Or one time I had something in mind and I called him and, you know, he called me right back. So so I'm, I'm just saying the context, like, why did this employee of Facebook think you were the person that Zuckerberg because, should call? So really simple. I had a reputation for two things, right? Being... Um, experienced and thoughtful about startup issues and being both um, unconflicted but also capable of keeping people's secrets. So in the book, I describe a whole bunch of things that happened to me early in my career. And people who know me really well were blown away by that chapter because things that happened while they knew me, they didn't know about. Mm. And, you know, like the opportunity I had to, buy a huge piece of Apple f with Steve, you know, when they were first doing the iPod. That's just not a story I tell. And I really didn't tell the origin story with Mark to people either. And it, it's just my personality. I just don't feel it's like their business. And so I didn't talk about it. And so when I met Mark, he was different from everybody, but in a kind of really cool, interesting way. I mean, a little creepy too, but you got to keep in mind, to, as you say, tech entrepreneurs aren't like you and me, right? They're, they're, the best of them are really extremely developed in the core things they need to do their plan, right? And really, you know, you talk about 10,000 hours. I mean, they're just perfectly tuned for the thing they're doing and sometimes completely undeveloped in things that a normal person would take for granted. I mean, I remember in the 80s, uh, I think it was Bill's 31st or 32nd birthday. I sent him my sense of the, he was just learning about movies. Like he hadn't really ever watched movies. So I sent him the 10 best American Westerns because he was making his way through the genres of American film. And he hadn't gotten to Westerns yet. So I sent him 10 of them on VHS tapes. You know, John Ford Westerns, something like that. Not because that was my favorite, but rather because I knew that was a category he hadn't gotten to yet. And he, the way Bill works is, you know, he does the deep dive, right? So if he's going to look at Westerns at all, he's going to look at the 10 best ones. And, uh, you know, I remember one time sending the very first Roomba to Steve Jobs because I'm going, I knew Steve was a neat freak. And I'm just like, I've got to send him this robotic vacuum cleaner because he's going to love this thing. And, of course, he hated it. He goes, oh, my God, it's so loud. And I'm thinking to myself, Steve has obviously never been around a real vacuum cleaner because a Roomba is so much quieter than when you plug into the wall. And... It was really funny because he loved the fact that he could navigate all by itself. But he just like, he was never around when whoever it was vacuumed up his apartment. It's funny when someone is, you know, Bill Gates is a great example and, and, and Mark Zuckerberg is also an example, but Bill Gates achieved such greatness and mastery and then wealth so early, it's almost like that wealth saturates the soul too early, so he never experienced. He's not. He doesn't know what it is to be every man, even though his products are used by every man. That's definitely true. Bill, though, did the thing I advise to all men. He married up. He married a woman who had been a product manager at Microsoft, who was both perfectly suited to him and opened up all the parts of Bill that had not really had a chance to bloom when he was CEO of Microsoft. But how, how does someone know? How how do you know when you meet that person that that's, oh, this per I'm marrying up now? I wrote a book about called Zucked, not a book called How to Find the Person. So I'll, <laughs> Next leave, I'll, I'll leave that. Yeah, exactly. I'll yeah. leave that to somebody else. I was lucky enough to do this as well. And, uh, you know, I think you know it when you see it. You know, it's got to be somebody, it's way more than respect. It's got to be somebody you admire, somebody you want to be like, somebody you just can't imagine not being with. And I know with my wife, Anne, that was exactly what happened to me. And it's certainly what happened to Bill. And Melinda brought out in Bill that he she directed his curiosity and his genius to philanthropy, solving problems like malaria. And, you know, the Gates Foundation hasn't been perfect, but boy, has it been great. And 
Bill is so interesting now. You know, I'll never forget him coming to the TED conference one year with this ball jar, uh, like a, uh, I guess a one quart ball jar. Oh, yeah. And he goes, So in here, I got a malaria mosquito. And then he opens it up and lets it fly around the room. And everybody's like this massive intake of air as everybody gasps. And of course, he's just pulling their chain. It was just a house fly in there. But, you know, as this thing was flying around, he played this joke on a thousand people who all thought they were the center of the universe and were afraid they were about to get malaria. And uh, the Bill Gates of the 80s, I don't think, would have done that. So, so, so okay, now Zuckerberg's in your office uh, debating whether to trust you because he had just gotten this offer and you had just predicted he was going to get this offer. Well, and and I don't yet know. I don't yet yeah. know he's gotten the offer. So anyway, it takes five minutes and I'm, 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 in my head, I'm just trying not to scream. It's like, I'm thinking, like, dude, you're in my office. Like, it's really impolite to wait so long before you say anything. And then all of a sudden, in fact, in my head, I'm imagining a cartoon bubble over his head with text scrolling by, like in a Warner Brothers cartoon. And then finally, he really visibly relaxes. He's decided. And I'm thinking, okay, thumbs up, thumbs down, right? And he goes, you're not going to believe this. And honestly, God, I put this in the book. I, I can't believe I said this. I said, oh, come on, just try me. And he goes, everything you predicted has just happened. That's why I'm here. And the whole meeting only lasted half an hour. But if you imagine there's hello, that probably one minute, then two minutes of my preamble, five minutes of dead silence. So we're sort of a little under the 10-minute mark. He was out of there in half an hour. We figured out how he didn't want to sell the company. It's just that everybody wanted him to, and he didn't want to disappoint them. So I just helped him understand that, wait a minute, the right argument here is you guys all signed up for my vision, and I still believe in my vision, and you'll be much happier if I deliver my vision than if we sell the company now. So let's go do this together. And he had what they call a golden vote, which meant you know everybody else votes, and then whatever way Mark goes was the way the company went. And so I just explained to him that, dude, just you tell him what it is. This is your company. There's got to be some confidence also that this offer is not going away a year later or two years later or three years later. He must have known that 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 money was kind of his for the taking. No, I, I, I'm not sure that that was a reasonable assumption. There are actually many examples of that not happening. Friends are being a great example. Yeah, there, there are examples of that. And so... Uh, I think a more likely thing was that he really believed in the vision of connecting the whole world on one network and that as things were architected at that time, there was no reason to believe he couldn't, you know, keep in mind, at that point we have no smartphones, right? So it's really a wired world of PCs. And the notion of getting to 100 million people in North America and and Europe, uh, the English-speaking portions of Europe, that was completely reasonable in my mind, and yet it was a huge leap. I mean, the Friendster got to a million people, right? So 100 million would be two orders of magnitude larger. And that's not what we talked about. We just talked about solving his problem. He goes away, and he sends me an email a day or two later and invites me to his office. And then that began a three-year period where I would visit at least once a month and sometimes once a week and sometimes more than once a week to help him deal with improving his management team because too many of the people had tried to sell the company and so he needed to get different people in those places. And he had the whole problem with the with the Winklevi, the Winklevoss brothers. You know, that whole thing came to a head right after we first met and so I helped him deal with the PR part of that. And then he decides he wants to get a new chief operating officer and I go, that's interesting. Let me think about it. But I already knew who I wanted to get. And so... Um, I went back to my office, and interestingly enough, uh, within a day or so, Sheryl Sandberg called me because she'd just gotten a job offer to go to work at the Washington Post. And I was really close to Sheryl because when she worked in Washington in the Treasury Department, she was the person Bono partnered with to do the Millennium Debt Forgiveness Program that essentially liberated all these developing countries around the world from debt they were never going to repay. And Bono goes, there's this dude in California who's like working with the Grateful Dead, helping them with their digital strategy. I need to meet this guy. And the way she told it at that time, she burst out laughing because she goes, hey, Bono, I know who that guy is. I've never met him, but my brother-in-law works for him. And uh, 
I, what I'd done is I was helping the dead after Jerry died just deal with the fact they had 60 employees and no tour to support everybody. And I just thought this, they, somebody brought him a real estate deal. And I said, look, I don't know anything about real estate, but I know a lot about tech. And you have this thing called dead.net. You sell music and um, T-shirts to your fans. I think we can build that up and federate it so other bands can use it and build real value here and change the world. So I went to work on that project and you too wanted to check it out. And so she wanted to meet me that, he wanted to meet me that way. So Cheryl introduces me to Bono. That's in 2000. And then uh, in uh, 2007, I get to return the favor. And so I say to her, look, if you're going to look at the Washington Post, you really got to take a look at Facebook. And she goes, eh, I don't know. He's 22. I'm going, yeah, but he's a really special 22. And long story short, after a couple of conversations, she agrees to go and meet him, and they hit it off. And I wasn't surprised at all because Mark comes from a family where he's got his mom, obviously, and he's got nothing but sisters and obviously, and a father. But he'd been around strong women his whole life. His mom's a psychologist, and uh, you know, I had no doubt that he would be co totally comfortable with a, a woman as his number two, which turned out to be true. And anyway, after a while, they come to a deal and she joins the company, at which point I'm thinking, my job here is done. And then not so long after that, they had an internal problem with a product that really was horrible and it was badly conceived and they should have fired a lot of people over this. And Can you say what the product is? You didn't mention it was, the exact it was, product. Yeah, it's called Beacon and it was this product oh, yeah, yeah, that basically, I'll tell you, the, the best way to describe it is with an anecdote. This is a product that basically tracked you as you went shopping in the real world and then posted on Facebook without your permission anything you bought in the price and the place and the time. And the anecdote that killed the product was a man bought an engagement ring at Overstock and Facebook published it in his news feed. So the way that his fiance found out that he was about to propose was she read about it on Facebook. She also read that he'd bought a discounted diamond ring at Overstock and everybody he knew found out at the same time. So the surprise was broken, all kinds of bad things happened. And that crystallized you know, Facebook's first disastrous attempt to really stretch the boundaries of privacy. But 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 what's interesting is you can look, it's it's like many of these arguments, and this is where the subtlety comes in with your book and also where the danger comes in is that there's good intentions, right? More sharing, more connecting, and so on. It feels like there was good intentions, but it has it could have even worse side effects. So here's what I would say to that. I think the notion of forcing people to do something new is almost always a bad idea unless it is a matter of their, you know, of life and death, Right. Uh, in general, if people should be able to make their own choices and move at their own pace. Well, um, even at that time, though, weren't there? You couldn't you make the choice not to? Uh, no, uh, okay. no, no. The initial thing was involuntary, mm -hmm. and I had, in fact, in the whatever it was month or two before they withdrew the product, I basically didn't spend any money with credit cards because I just didn't want to have it show up. Uh, it was long. Long story short, that that incident. Um, I went to Cheryl and talked about it philosophically, and she explained to me that Facebook was a team and they were going to live or die as a team, and there was no individual credit on the way up, and there would be no individual blame on the way down. And I pointed out to her that on the way up, that's no problem, but on the way down, that was a huge problem. When people made mistakes, there are some mistakes that really you don't want people to feel like that was okay. You don't want, you know, you need to have some incentive for people not to make catastrophic errors. And certainly people get fired at Facebook. Like, when, where does she draw the line? Or it's not a team anymore. So nobody gets fired for for any, as far as I can tell, for pretty much any cause other than crossing Cheryl and Mark, right? Mm. Um, I mean, that may not be exactly true, but I think that was philosophically how she thought about it. And, and you know, when you get down the stack, there can be other reasons, but I'm talking about the immediate team right. around them. And the that was when I realized, you know... I'm not going to have the same impact going forward that I've had in the past. So, you know, it's time for me to move on, which is completely standard. In the mentoring business, nothing's forever. I mean, there, you know, every once in a while, somebody will have a mentor who stays in their orbit forever. And I thought maybe that would be a fun thing to do. But I said to Mark, dude, I think my work here is done. Cheryl's got this. 
you know, you guys have got under control. I'm just going to sit in the sidelines and be a cheerleader. And I had a ball doing that. I mean, oh my God, so many good things happen. But the problem was the point in time when I stopped being intimate with the business was about two years before they developed the business model that caused all the problems. So I didn't see it develop. I didn't understand how it was going on. So when 2016 came and I first started to see bad actors harming innocent people, I had no idea what the mechanism was that was allowing that to happen. But I saw it in all these different areas. Originally elections, then Black Lives Matter, then Brexit, then um, housing and urban development, citing Facebook for ad tools that allowed discrimination. And I, I, just, I went to Mark and Cheryl in October 2016 and said, guys, there's something really wrong here. Something wrong with the business model and the algorithms. And Because you felt that somehow you or people you knew were being subtly manipulated by No, no, I hadn't gotten to that point. No, no, I didn't know about manipulation yet. All I could see was these four distinct, it it was actually more than four, but those are the four that at the moment come to mind, um, examples of where the tools created for legitimate advertisers could be used to harm people. That is, that things that were well-intended could have side effects that were really bad. And I said to him, I think that these four things are sufficiently different that we have to allow for the possibility that it's systemic. And so I wrote an op-ed for the Recode blog on the topic. And instead of publishing it, I sent it to Mark and Cheryl. I said, guys, I think there's something really wrong here. And at that time, I thought they were the victims. I'm trying to alert them as their friend. And they responded immediately, very politely, but also saying, hey, dude, this stuff is all isolated and we've taken care of it. But we respect you, and so we're going to have you work with one of our senior guys, a good friend of mine, Dan Rose. And uh, I did that, and we had a couple of conversations, then the election happens. And when the election happened, I went parabolic, and that's where the book begins. I just, I'm looking at this whole thing going, we just found out about the Russian interference. We'd known about Manafort, and I'm going, oh, my God, what if the Russians were part of what I'd seen? What if they'd had something to do with Brexit? I mean, I didn't know, but it sure looked that way, and I lost my cool at Dan. And for three months, I'm begging him, do what Johnson & Johnson did after that guy put poison in bottles of Tylenol. Johnson & Johnson said, you know, we didn't put the poison in there, but these are our customers. They took every bottle of Tylenol off every shelf in every store in America and kept it off till they invented tamper-proof packaging. And the consequence of that was a short-term hit to their earnings, but a massive increase in trust. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Pick's favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests 
to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever gonna make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So just to understand, and from reading your descriptions of it in the book, the Russians basically would create kind of what looked like real people that were trustworthy. They would create groups. They would disseminate messages that would get out there through advertising. They would encourage people to join the groups. And then you have all sorts of cognitive biases that you want to feel like you're in the group and it would sway behavior. So I didn't understand that when I reached out to them in the fall of 2016. That waited until I met Tristan Harris in the spring of 2017. So Tristan had just been on 60 Minutes talking about what he calls brain hacking. And brain hacking was the use of techniques from slot machines, from uh, propaganda, from magic, things that when you implement them in technology allow you to basically manipulate people's attention, to provoke fear and anger in people, to get them to spend more time. And in manipulating their attention, if you're in an ad model where you make all this data available to the advertiser, you you basically take people who develop habits, some of them develop addictions, right? So they're, you know, well, I always say to people when I first meet them, so in the morning, when do you check your phone the first time? Is it before you pee or while you're peeing? For everybody, it's one of the two, right? So we're all addicted. And so once you're addicted, if somebody wants to use those tools 
to do harm. They can do that. And what Tristan explained to me was how they do it. And this is what the Russians did. And there's a couple principles here. One of them is that you can form a Facebook group that sounds completely authentic and have a real troll in there to lead the group and then fill it up with a ton of bots. And the bots need to equate to about 1% to 2% of the size of the group. And then you have some message. And the early ones they did were very, very uh, con uh, controversial issues like gun control, um, Black Lives Matter, immigration, and uh, you know just a whole set of things. And they would form these groups and they would basically pretend to be authentic activists. And often they would have people on both sides of the same issue in different groups. And they would use ads to attract people into the groups and then use the bots and the troll to control the group. Because basically once you join something, a series of things happen. You may be curious about anti-vax when you join an anti-vax thing and you think, well, I'm not sure if there's a connection between vaccines and autism. But you get into this group and what happens is the group's share stuff that reinforces the perspective and they share it multiple times a day. So you wind up consuming the stuff over and over again. And after a period of months, your position hardens and becomes more extreme. Plus the AI of the newsfeed algorithm will start showing you a, in general anti-newsfeed, anti-vax uh, And articles. by the way, once they get you on one conspiracy theory, they've discovered that you're going to be susceptible to other conspiracy theories. And so the Russians play to this big time. And the key thing to understand about this is their initial objective was just to undermine democracy. But Trump comes along and he's got a campaign that's built on basically the same themes that they'd been out there promoting. So uniquely among the Republicans, he got this huge lift from all the people who were in these Rus Russian influence groups. And so he gets nominated. So I think the Russians' biggest impact on the elections, interestingly enough, was getting Trump nominated. And then once you get into the... Uh, what we discovered was that once you got into the general election, the Russians were still doing a lot of stuff, but the big things in the general election cycle were the WikiLeaks stuff and you know the hacks of the DNC and the DCCC and you know all of that stuff. And then it was Trump's campaign with Bannon's strategy of uh, of using the tools inside Facebook to invert politics. Normal politics used to be you're running for mayor of New York, and you're going to run for mayor of New York on the basis of a higher minimum wage and a couple other things. You have to convince me to vote for you because those are the right things to do and find people who think those things are important. Well, what Bannon's insight was, what Facebook knew so much about everybody, they knew what their emotional triggers were. What you really wanted to do was figure out each person's unique emotional trigger and then make a campaign built around that. And so let's say that um, they find people who are on both sides of Black Lives Matter. And they would go to one community, the pro-Black Lives Matter side, and they know they're not going to get those people to vote for Trump, so they knock down Clinton and essentially discourage those people from voting entirely. Mm. And they find some other issue like guns, and they may basically say they may heighten the contrast or uh, maybe immigration or the economy or taxes or something, whatever the issue is. If they think they can uh, get you more interested, they will do that. But the, the thing it was really good at was suppressing the vote. And there were 4 million people who voted for Obama in 2012 who didn't vote at all in 2016. And I don't know how much of that was due to the, that campaign that, that uh, Bannon conceived. But keep in mind, Bannon was the guy who created Cambridge Analytica. The data set the Trump campaign used was the data set that Facebook you know, that was stolen from Facebook, you know, let's say misappropriated from Facebook, that in theory had been destroyed. And the people who were running the campaign, the actual ad campaign, were Facebook employees and butted in the Trump campaign. And there hadn't been a lot of discussion about that. But given how close the election was and the fact that there was a big focus on voter suppression, you can't exclude the possibility that it affected the outcome. Now, data in general is largely available still on Facebook. Like advertisers can target in interest like gun control, not gun control. Or, or, or like, you you know, if somebody like me can promote a book called Zucked to people who, you know, are on Facebook and Instagram because guess what? That book is targeted at people who are on Facebook and Instagram, right? So if you are an advertiser today, there is nothing like Facebook, literally nothing. I mean, Google's great for 
product sales and things, but for any kind of brand building exercise or Facebook is the best advertising platform ever invented. That's why the earnings are so strong right now. And there's really no substitute for it. And so as an, a legitimate advertiser, it's the greatest thing ever created. The problem is all those same tools can be used for ill as well as good. And therein lies the problem that the, the engagement model is based on appealing to the weakest elements of human psychology. And, and so, so this is like, we all love it. Like, you know, like you say, billions of people love Facebook. They haven't really stopped using it because of these issues. I all. haven't stopped using it. Right. I, I've changed my usage a lot, but, but I still use it. The band still runs off it. I'm promoting the book on it. I mean, my point here is we have to use our attention differently if we want to be safe going forward. So realistically, like, and you present a lot of great solutions towards the end, you know, ranging from company involvement, user involvement, government involvement, and at least the discussion's happening. And I think awareness is always the, the first, awareness is the, always the first part of any, you know, addiction solution. But realistically, because it's, you know, advertisers just suck off that hose so much, uh, you know, just the data is is indispensable. No, no, that's right. But but we also need to understand that our the way we think about things like privacy is now obsolete. People come up to me and say, Roger, my data's already out there. I can't get it back. That is indisputably true. And they say, Roger, I'm a good guy. I have nothing to fear. And I go, that's probably true. It's also neither one of those things is relevant. And the reason is because the way that Facebook and Google work, they hoover up all the data available in the economy. For example, you may not know this, but your cellular carrier sells all your location data to oh. anybody who will buy it. Oh, by the way, I just got an email this morning from Google Maps. I don't know why they thought I would be happy to see this email. They said, uh, um, hey, we thought you'd like to know all the places you visited last month. And there's a Google Map and all the locations I've been and when each time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't okay. necessarily know if I, yeah, okay. if this is a good thing. It's definitely not a good thing. And Apple, <laughs> Let's have Alzheimer's. that's one of the ways that, <laughs> that Apple's different and, and maybe better. So another thing is that credit card companies and credit card processors will send all your payment information. So what happens is that Google and Facebook can now reconstruct where you spent money and when from the intersection of those two things. Now they layer that into all the other data they have. And they have this not just on the people who use their products, but on every single person for whom there's data. And with that, so if you think about it, the part they use against you, the thing people are worried about is being hacked, right? They don't want to have their bank account broken into. What they don't realize is that there is a social component to the value of their data, which is that you have friends and there are people who look like you that you may or may not know. And the more they know about each person, the more predictive power that data has relative to the behavior of other people. And that social piece of it is now the dominant part of the economics. And the reason right, cuz an advertiser can say I know it's more than just people. advertiser. It's more than just advertisers. Let me explain where the real problem comes in. So, it, let's say you go out and buy a smart speaker, you know, go get an Alexa device or you get a, you know, a smart refrigerator or a smart TV or your car and they're all Alexa powered or Google Home powered. So, the problem that we face today is that before, they could only track you on your phone, right? And if the app was turned off, they couldn't really see what you were doing. But with Alexa power and things, the whole Internet of Things, they're listening all the time. And they're listening in a lot of places where historically you didn't let them listen. You know, maybe the kitchen's okay. You might be okay in the living room. But how about your home office or how about your bedroom? How much listening do you want going on in those places? So and keep in mind, these things are hackable. We had a story last week. Google's Nest division has a security product. And somebody hacked it and made some people think that, you know, that nuclear missiles had been launched towards the U.S. and scared the bejesus out of them. And, you know, that's what we're up against here is that we're now at this place where you don't have to use the products to be harmed. And this is why, I mean, think about Myanmar as the greatest example. Google is not really a factor there, but Facebook dominates the internet in a lot of developing markets. And Myanmar, the former Burma, is one of them. And the Buddhist hierarchy and the military decided to wage a what the UN called 
uh, classic ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya minority. And they used Facebook to do it. And they created hate speech, and 9,000 people were killed for certain, and 42,000 people are missing and presumed dead. So maybe 51,000 in six months. Now, I think that compares to 56,000 Americans killed in Vietnam in 10 years. So it's a really big number. And you didn't have to be on Facebook to be dead, okay? Now, that's extreme, but there, the, the analogy is holds for all these things with the surveillance stuff, which is that in the old days, advertising was about gathering data to better match products and services to the people who use them. Mm-hmm. Facebook and Google, that's not what this is about at all. They're getting it so that they can basically manipulate your attention and ultimately manipulate your behavior to their ends. So, so, so Roger, I know um, your time is limited and we've actually been slightly over time. So I, I, I have a, a thousand more questions, but this is a great teaser. People should read your book to see even more in-depth analysis of the problems and, and your solutions. I have one final question for you, and then I hope next time you're in the city, you come on again and we continue this. Is there a chance, do you think Google or Facebook could actually be arms of the intelligence community of the U.S.? And that's I, why there's a I lot don't, of hands off. I don't honestly know. Until you just asked me that question, I'd never given it a moment's consideration. Um, I suppose it's possible. What I would tell you about all of this stuff is that we need a new vocabulary. We need to think about these problems differently. The business that Facebook and Google ate is not advertising as we knew it in the past. And thinking about it that way gets in our way. The privacy violations are a new kind of privacy violation, so you have to be open to that. Everything about it is different. And you see this in artificial intelligence in particular, where there are three real money-making uses of it today. Getting rid of white-collar jobs, telling people what to think with filter bubbles, that's what you see on Facebook and Google, and telling people what to buy or enjoy, which is what you get with recommendation engines. And think about the things that make you, James, me, Roger, right? I mean, what we do for work, the things we believe, and the things we enjoy, those are going to be pretty high on that list. And if you have computers replacing those things in our lives, does that make us more or less human? I think it makes us a lot less human. So my recommendation on the whole thing is we have to clear space for alternatives, going back to bicycles for the mind, the idea that technology is there to make us stronger, better, smarter, more capable, rather than things that take away the fundamental elements that make us individuals. Well, Roger McNamee, uh, such a great discussion. I could have I could talk to you for five more hours about this. Uh, uh, and I I'll be you... back in a month. How All right, come, come again? back again. We'll, we'll release this. Everyone should read Zucked in the meantime. Please Because I have a thousand more questions getting into the weeds of, of data, the good, the bad, the ugly, AI, the good, the bad, and the ugly, how we could use it better to advance society as opposed to going down the holes you're, you're suggesting in the book. And it was great meeting you, and I look forward to our next meeting. Look forward to it. Thank you Thanks, so much. Roger. Your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the Snapdragon processor powering the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge-of-your-seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra-realistic graphics, and adrenaline-boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.